Yeah. So. so proper giving welcome everyone and just to say you know if you've got any questions um, just stick it in the chat line and Christine will interrupt me periodically and we will see how this goes. So um, this is where I currently work. This is the, um, does my cursor work on screen Christine? Mm, yes sir. Yes Thank good. Um, so Diamond Light Source I'm actually speaking from a few kilometers away from here at home because uh, most of us are still working from home um, but this is the, the Harwell campus which combines um, a neutron facility and a synchrotron source, the two types of facilities I'll be talking about. In the intro, Christine talked about briefly about my previous job. So this was my previous view of my work from, from on high. And there are a few pixels in the background here where these two rivers converge. And I'm gonna bring, um, bring you closer, which also show this combination of uh, X-ray facility. So this is the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, the Central European S Facility for Synchrotron Radiation, and beside it, the place I used to work, the um, the ILL, the European um, uh, Neutron Scattering Centre. The convergence of these um, two rivers in 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 southeast France. I should say, not very far from where Christine herself grew up and comes from. Um, so another view of our our, our site, another a view of the the synchrotron facility and this neutron facility here and then where Christine currently works and where will be the the center uh, the, the the future European neutron um, facility ESS in Lund again brings together um, a neutron facility this is an artist impression but in a few years time this should be what it looks like alongside the existing um, uh, synchrotron max 4 in in Lund in in, in Sweden so one of the things I hope to illustrate with this is showing that these very large uh, machines or facilities to enable science, each of them too large for an individual university and therefore in general founded and owned at a national or an international level, are increasingly being co-located synchrotron facilities with neutron facilities. Perhaps um, uh, slightly jokingly, if one looks at the the distribution of synchrotron and neutron facilities in any one country, you tend to find a, a spike in the distribution at about one kilometer. Uh, again, illustrating uh, the fact that co-location is a strong feature of these facilities. And that's because the two types of measurement, measurement with synchrotron X-rays or measurement with, with, with neutrons provide complementary ways of looking at um, materials or looking at biological systems and more complete understanding of these systems. So I'm going to start, however, with in the first three or four lectures um, with, uh, with synchrotron sources and what one can do with synchrotron radiation. And let's start with the, with the history of where these facilities came from. Um, so synch the origin of synchrotrons lie in high energy physics, in, in, in work that started um, over 100 years ago with scientists trying to understand what the structure of the nucleus was. And one of the principal tools, the most powerful tool at their disposal, uh, was accelerators, accelerators of charged particles. And here on the left is a photograph of the, the English physicist Chadwick in his office, or his laboratory rather, in Cambridge in the early 1930s, with an example of a linear accelerator. So accelerating charged particles with very high electric fields, and then bombarding a particular target with them to try and split apart um, uh, to, 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 to try and split apart uh, the nuclei of atoms into their con constituent components and then study those components to tell us about what the structure of the nucleus was. And um, as, as, as uh, people wished to dig to look deeper and deeper into nuclear structure, so they developed ever more powerful accelerators, longer, more powerful linear accelerators, um, but also a little bit later on, um, uh, accelerators which had a had a circular configuration and this is a is an example of what's called a cyclotron so this is Livermore in his laboratory uh, in California in the 1940s um, and here the principle is again to inject charged particles um, uh, in a powerful electric field um, uh, and in this case between the, 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 the poles of a very powerful magnet. Now, if you direct charged particles, electrons, protons, for example, um, in a trajectory between the poles of a powerful magnet, um, they will describe a circular arc. And if you get the timing um, of, uh, uh, you, 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 you get the, the particles to describe a circular arc. And in, in the cyclotron, um, as, the, as the particles circulate 
uh, move between uh, around the, 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 the magnetic lines of force, um, you then subject those charged particles to uh, alternating electric fields, which cause them to alternately accelerate in this direction or that direction, up or down the page, if you like. Um, and uh, under the influence of the, the powerful magnetic field, the end result is a cyclic trajectory of increasing um, speed. And eventually, um, uh, with, with sufficiently powerful synchronized electric fields, one can accelerate electrons to describe a circular um, trajectory at very, very high speeds indeed. Now, this technology, the so-called cyclotron, was limited by the size of the powerful permanent magnets that you could build. This is pretty much at the engineering limits in the bottom right hand photograph of what we could build in terms of powerful permanent magnets. And then some bright individual had the idea, well, you don't have to um, provide uh, 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 the, the, the magnet in the form just of one single powerful magnet. The same effect could be achieved by placing a series of powerful dipole magnets um, uh, uh, around a, a, a circular evacuated tube. So as the electrons um, uh, are injected into this tube uh, and travel between powerful dipolar magnets, so their trajectory, oops, sorry, their trajectory um, <clears throat> is deflected again in a, in, a, in a circular fashion to describe the arc. And as long as you keep on giving them a little bit of a push each time they go around with a synchronized uh, electric field, you can get the electrons to, um, to, to, to achieve and then maintain uh, very high velocities. And this device, which involved synchronized application of electric field, became known as a synchrotron. And this was the basis then of the most powerful uh, accelerators of electrons, protons, and principal other charged particles, which were then uh, used as the basis of, um, uh, of, of, of uh, measurements of of uh, uh, a nuclear structure by colliding these beams originally with static targets and then uh, with each other. And of course, um, uh, over the course of the 50s and 60s and 70s, so the engineering improved and people were able to build bigger and bigger um, uh, synchrotrons. This is the synchrotron that was built uh, at the site uh, at Harwell. Um, this is the so-called Nimrod proton synchrotron. It was the biggest uh, facility ever built, in fact still is the biggest facility ever built on British soil, which has a circumference now of hundreds of meters. Um, you can see it here partway through construction with the people to give it a sense of scale. Uh, and then ultimately this would enable um, scientists to accelerate protons to uh, extremely high velocities and then collide them um, with targets to split apart with that high energy uh, nuclei into their um, constituent components. And of course the famous modern example of a synchrotron uh, with extremely large sizes, the Large Hadron Collider here, underground in France and Switzerland near Geneva. Um, Christine will be able to tell us what the circumference is. My, in my memory, I have it as 32 kilometers, but this enables us to, um, uh, to accelerate particles up to the kind of energies that are required to, uh, to, 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 to uh, produce um, the most exotic particles. Now, one of the consequences of uh, accelerating charged particles up to high velocities and then getting them to describe a circular orbit according to Maxwell's equations from the, the, the middle of the 19th century is that circulating charged particles will emit, um, uh, will emit uh, 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 energy in the form of um, uh, electromagnetic radiation. And as the charged particles velocity increases, um, uh, so the nature of that radiation changes. The limiting condition being as the charged particle approach the, the speed of light. And um, as, as the velocity increases towards the speed of light, so that light becomes higher in energy, um, it becomes rather more coherent um, in the sense that uh, photons in the laser are coherent, um, and it also becomes more focused uh, in the direction, the tangential direction at the, any moment in its circular orbit. So um, what one finds is that 
as the electron approaches the speed of light. So we end up with this limiting form of radiation, which became known as synchrotron radiation because it was generated in synchrotrons. Now that form of radiation at the time was seen simply as a nuisance. First of all, um, it, was, it was radiation that was potentially harmful to, um, to workers at synchrotron. So it required the synchrotron to be heavily shielded to protect workers from this radiation. And secondly, as the circulating electron gives out, um, out energy in the form of electromagnetic radiation, so you have to keep injecting energy back into the system to maintain it at the same velocity. So initially synchrotron radiation um, was seen um, as, uh, as a nuisance um, and as parasitic. I should say incidentally that when the first um, synchrotrons uh, were built, uh, the, the initial cyclotrons and then synchrotrons were built, um, <coughs> synchrotron radiation was actually a concept rather than something that had been um, physically um, seen. Um, Synchrotron radiation, however, exists in the natural world. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful record from over a thousand years ago by Chinese astronomers um, recording the emergence of the Crab Nebula, um, as I've said about a thousand years ago, which in these terms was just recorded as the, 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 the new existence of light in a particular uh, part of the sky. So um, to, with, the, with, with, with the absence of at the time, of course, the astronomy was, was, was conducted with the naked eye and all the astronomers could see was they observed that there was a new light in that part of the sky. Nowadays, we know that that light um, had a major element of synchrotron radiation. So in the formation of, of the Crab Nebula, there is the creation of high densities of charged particles streaming through space in the presence of strong electric and magnetic fields. Um, uh, causing those charged particles to change direction uh, very, very quickly with the emission of this uh, highly intense uh, synchrotron radiation. The first actual physical observation of synchrotron radiation on Earth, however, um, uh, was a little bit later on in 1946, reported in 1947. So having, um, having predicted that under these uh, uh, high velocity conditions, uh, electrons would emit this kind of radiation, a group of researchers in the US uh, set out to observe it. This is a, a, the, one of the, the early laboratory-based synchrotrons, a very small, compact synchrotron. What I love about this, this result is that the first observation of synchrotron radiation, a momentous result, is reported in just a few hundred words of a paper. Nowadays, those of you who are familiar with the scientific literature are used to papers being dozens and dozens of pages. And I, I love the economy with which this was reported, um, the, the, the small number of words in which this groundbreaking observation was, was reported. And from that, as I said, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, th this, this observation was at the, at the early stage in the development of synchrotrons themselves. Um, synchrotron radiation uh, was seen as a nuisance, somewhat parasitic. But then in the 1960s, scientists started to realize that the radiation could be useful in its own right. So um, in the UK, but this, the, the same was true in several other countries around the world that had started to um, develop synchrotrons for high energy physics, um, scientists started to wonder whether or not they could use this radiation for other kinds, for, for, for measurements. So for example, um, uh, near Manchester, there was a, 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 an electron synchrotron built called NINA and chemists and physicists from the University of Manchester um, uh, understood that this generated very intense ultraviolet light and they thought that this might be useful uh, in, the, in, in, in spectroscopic measurements. So on the left, you see some of the, the, the very first um, use of synchrotron radiation to, to perform measurement or probe materials in its own right. This, this tube here taking off some of the ultraviolet light um, from part of the synchrotron on the right here in Nina. And that started, um, uh, that was the start of uh, the use of synchrotron radiation to perform other kinds of measurements. And from that small group of pioneering scientists, there grew a community who started to appreciate that intense light in the ultraviolet and the X-ray part of the spectrum could be used to make powerful measurements of materials and biological systems. So by the end of the 70s, the community in the UK and the community in other countries in the world had grown sufficiently large to start to make the case to build synchrotrons, not for high energy physics, 
but to perform measurements with the radiation themselves. So in the bottom right, what you see here is the world's first synchrotron that was built with the dedicated purpose of generating light with which to do research. So to use the synchrotron radiation itself, rather than regard it as a purely parasitic consequence of, uh, of, of, of these machines for high energy physics. And this is what we call a second generation synchrotron. So the first generation synchrotrons uh, were these early machines for high energy physics. Second generation synchrotrons were built um, with the purpose of generating synchrotron radiation with which to do other forms of research. And they were, they were built in a way that optimized their performance to, to generate that light. So you saw in that earlier picture of a, of a synchrotron with, a, with an, an array of magnets. Let's just go back to it. Um, an array of magnets uh, around a perfectly circular ring in this case. The, the next generation synchrotrons had a slightly different configuration. Yes, and, and, and I've, this is drawn in the cartoon on the right here. Yes, they had a, a roughly circular shape, but when you looked more carefully, the circle was composed of straight sections, each of which was joined by a very by a, by a, a by a bend where there was a very powerful so-called bending or dipolar magnet. So as the electrons um, uh, circulated around the ring, they would travel first along a straight section, then they would change their direction abruptly, and at that point, as they went through these bending magnets. Uh, illustrating the cartoon on the top left and with a photograph on the on the bottom left, this was the point at which they gave out brilliant flashes of, of, of light. So schematically, the second generation synchrotron looked a little bit like the cartoon on the top right. Um, we have a source of electrons, uh, generally a piece of metal such as tungsten that you heat up. This is the so-called electron gun or the, the source in the electron gun. The electrons in that piece of heated metal um, are excited. They're more susceptible to being pulled off in a high electric field. Um, and they are then accelerated in, in the LINAC, this linear accelerator, um, uh, through very high voltages um, uh, until by the end of the LINAC, they, they're already traveling uh, extremely quickly. And then they're injected into this ring here, the so-called synchrotron. And as they rotate around the ring, they received, as I said earlier, a synchronized pulse um, uh, of electric, uh, a synchronized fluctuating electric field in the RF, the radio frequency region of the spectrum. And if this is synchronized correctly, those electrons will accelerate until they reach almost the velocity of light. And then they're injected into this much larger so-called storage ring. So the real guts of it is the, is, is, is the booster synchrotron here. Uh, and then once they're injected into this large storage ring, um, all they need is a, is a little bit of a push um, as they go around each time to maintain that velocity close to that of light. Uh, and as they circulate to the ring, as I've said, each time they go through one of these bending magnets and change direction, they give out a, a brilliant flash of light. So that's the second generation synchrotron. And then the next development that brings us almost to the present day is the introduction of devices that uh, allow even brighter light to be generated from the, the, the electron beam as it circulates around the storage ring. And these are so-called insertion devices. And again, um, I, there's a cartoon in, in the top left here. So an insertion device in general involves uh, a, a, an array a linear array of very powerful dipolar magnets whose polarity um, alternates. So I've, 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 I've depicted the north-south poles with the two different colors here. And as the electron beam um, traverses this so-called insertion device, um, so the alternating magnetic field causes the trajectory of the electron to alternate first left and then right. And as it goes through, each of these excursions, each of these changes of direction, it gives out uh, a burst of, of light. And again, if you get the, the spacing of the, the, ma the, 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 the uh, magnetic array correctly, you can ensure that the pulses of light from each burst uh, superposed with each other and they add together with a degree of coherence so that the light that you get at the end of this insertion device uh, 
is the sum of the light produced at each excursion added together uh, with some degree of coherence. So you get even brighter light from these so-called insertion devices. And depending on the exact configuration, these are called um, undulators or wigglers, but either way, uh, they allow you to generate far brighter and to some extent coherent light compared to the light at, at bending magnets. And these devices would now be placed in the straight sections between the bending magnets. So here on the bottom left is a photograph of a typical, typical, um, they're all tend to be slightly different um, uh, insertion device. And you can see in the detail here, the individual magnetic poles rather close together. So this involves really quite intense magnetic fields. And this is the basis of the so-called third generation um, synchrons of which the first example in the world was the ESRF in Grenoble, which started operations uh, in the early 1990s. So what we have seen over the last few decades is an incredible increase in the brightness of radiation that these types of um, these types of machines can um, can 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 produce. And the the graph, the, the the schematic graph in the bottom right, gives you an idea of that uh, of that evolution. So if you look at conventional um, laboratory based um, uh, X ray equipment based on, on sealed um, uh, tubes where uh, an electron beam is directed onto a metal target. And you then look at the increase in brightness as we went from first to second to third generation synchrotrons. We go from um, uh, brilliance was expressed in terms of photons per square centimetre, um, uh, an increase in brilliance um, of about 13 or 14 orders of magnitude. So an incredible step change in the brilliance of sources. And with that, a step change in the kind of measurements that we can make. So um, just, to, just to try and tie some of that together, um, here's just a, an animation um, in the case of diamond, but this could be any synchrotron, all modern synchrotrons, all modern third generation synchrotrons, and there are dozens of them around the world now, essentially operate on the, on the same principle. Let's just see this for diamond. Um, this is very schematic. There isn't so much grass and trees around it. This was probably produced in the days when this was a bit of a building site. Um, so we're going to fly over diamond uh, and we're going to look over the roof in a moment and you'll see those same components, the electron gun, the LINAC, the booster synchrotron and then the storage ring. So what we have here is the electron gun, piece of tungsten heated up, electrons come off this, accelerate, injected into the LINAC um, and then as those electrons come off the LINAC, they're put into the, the booster ring and they're accelerated with these synchronized pul RF pulses. And then when they reach almost the speed of light, they're injected into the large storage ring. And as they go around that, through the bending magnets and through the insertion devices, so brilliant flashes of light are given out, which are then used by a series of instruments that we call beam lines. And we'll talk about the nature of the different beam lines and how that uh, that light is used um, in a moment. And I should say that what you can see there is that one synchrotron with its many bending magnets and its many straight sections that can have insertion devices, in principle, can provide the source simultaneously for many different instruments. So in the case of diamond, we have 24 of these cells. Um, we have in principle, up to 24 bending magnets that could be used for this purpose and up to 24 straight sections. Now, of course, some of them are taken up with other pieces of equipment, but a synchrotron like Diamond or the ESRF will have something between 30 and 40, <coughs> excuse me, different instruments that can be simultaneously fed with this incredibly, incredible source of, source of radiation. So I've said already that synchrotron radiation is, is, is extremely bright. Um, when, when diamond was switched on, um, it was the brightest continuous source of light in our solar system. Um, uh, the same is true of any modern synchrotron. Um, it's, it, it's at that sort of level of um, brightness. Um, it also has an energy that's tunable. So a synchrotron can generate photons, it's mostly in the X-ray part of the spectrum, um, but actually depending on the the, the insertion device or the bending magnet, you can generate photons all the way from the infrared into, uh, into the X-ray part of the spectrum. Now, it turns out that there are other ways in which we can generate um, intense uh, infrared and ultraviolet radiation using conventional lasers. 
Um, so most synchrotrons tend to uh, focus their activity and generate light in the X-ray part of, of the spectrum. I'm sure you're all familiar um, with the sorts of energies um, involved and the corresponding um, uh, um, uh, wavelengths, um, but it doesn't go amiss just to remind ourselves, of course, the relationship between wavelength and energy is summarized in the Broglie's relationship e equals h Planck's constant times um, times the frequency. Um, we tend to talk about the wavelength, well, in SI units, of course, in nanometers, but you you might also hear me use the, the unit of angstrom, 0.1 nanometers, which is a unit beloved by crystallographers because um, distances between atoms and crystals tend to be expressed in, uh, tend to be of the order of 0.1 nanometers, and it's easier to talk about one of something rather than 0.1 of something. So crystallographers tend to talk in angstroms. Um, and the energy scales that we use, well, you know, those of us from different scientific backgrounds use different scales, uh, use different units for energy. Of course, the SI unit, again, is the joule, um, but spectroscopists sometimes use units in called, called wave numbers. Um, in synchrotron radiation, uh, we often use the unit of energy called the electron volt, which relates back to the origins and accelerator physics, you know, the electron volt um, being the energy that um, an, an electron acquires that accelerates um, through one volt potential difference. Um, the kind of energies that, and of course it's the same sorts of units that's used in semiconductor physics and so forth and band gaps. Um, uh, and, and again, people tend to sort of talk in terms of shorthand and so forth, there are simple conversion units, but the sorts of magnitudes of energies and wavelengths that we'll be mostly talking about uh, in the applications in both diffraction, crystallography, and also in spectroscopy um, are uh, multiples of electron volts, so typically 10 electron volts, sorry, 10,000 uh, electron volts or 10 kilovolts. And 10 kilovolts uh, corresponds to electron uh, photons whose wavelength um, is of the order of 0.1 nanometers. But to be precise, the electron, the energy in kilovolts is 12.4 divided by the wavelength in, in angstrom. So um, sp uh, synchrotron uh, scientists tend to tend to to talk, as I've said, in terms of kilovolts or wavelengths in terms of angstroms as a sort of a shorthand for the sort of ballpark they're, they're uh, talking with in terms of both units. Okay, so so how do these X-rays, the X-rays we generate at synchrons interact um, with mat matter. And I I'll start talking in rather general terms, and then we'll look both in more detail at the nature of the interaction and then at the application. So over the course of the next few minutes, I just want to take you through some of the more general, na na more general nature of the interaction of X-rays with materials. And then we'll look at this in more detail <clears throat> at the level of what goes on in atoms and then what that tells us uh, about the atoms in the material, um, uh, their, 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 um, uh, uh, the structure, uh, the atomic structure in, in, in crystals, and also um, the type of information, the chemical information we get uh, from atoms in materials through spectroscopic measurements. And there, there are, in very general terms, there are three sorts of measurement that we perform at a synchrotron um, with x-rays. And this could be illustrated uh, by considering what happens when we direct uh, an x-ray beam at a, at a sample of a generic sample of a material. So the sample is, is this circle in the material here, so it's in the middle here. And we imagine the variety of processes that can occur when you subject uh, that material to x-rays. So some of those x-rays will excite electronic processes within the atoms of the material. So within the atoms, there are uh, electrons around the nucleus, and the X-rays can excite those electrons either to higher energy electronic states, or uh, if they have sufficient energy, they can cause the electrons to be excited to, to leave the, um, the atoms themselves. We have what are called photoionization um, events. So the result of subjecting a material to x-rays can be the ejection of photoelectrons. Um, it can be the excitation of electrons in the material and then relaxation to give out light or fluorescence. Uh, and sometimes uh, th those intermediate excited states, and we'll look at this in greater detail later, can give rise to the ejection of secondary uh, electrons, a so-called Auger process. But collectively, all of these processes involve the absorption of x-rays with the excitation of 
um, of electrons in some form. And collectively, these are all called spectroscopic transitions. So these, these gives rise to absorption of the X-rays in spectroscopic transitions. So we'll, we'll look as in part of this course at um, the more fundamental fundamental nature of the spectroscopy, tra the, the transitions involved in spectroscopy, but also what that tells us about materials. And we'll see this is a really powerful probe of uh, what the elements are in the material and also what their chemical state is. Uh, and just the cartoon at the right, and we'll come back to this later, is the very first spectroscopic measurement of materials with x-rays telling us, giving us a fingerprint of exactly what elements you find. This is one of Henry Mosley's first um, first measurements. We'll come back to that later. So absorption uh, giving uh, uh, related to spectroscopic transitions, telling us about electronic structure. Um, secondly, some of the elect some of the X-rays that are directed into the material are scattered um, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, by by the material, primarily in an elastic fashion. And these scattering processes are responsible for phenomena such as diffraction. And this is what uh, tells us that this is what gives us the foundation of crystallography. It is the most powerful probe, provides the most powerful probe of exactly where the atoms are uh, in the material. We'll also see there's a, a particular type of scattering with a small change in energy of the um, uh, of the uh, the incoming photons, which also tells us about the collective excitation of atoms in, in the material. It tells us, for example, about the nature of the vibrations uh, in the material. But these processes are collectively known as scattering. They reveal the structure and some of the collective excitations in the material. And they're another process which reduces the intensity of the um, X-rays as they traverse through the material. So what you get out the other end in the emergent beam, so the comparison between the instant beam and the emergent beam um, is, well, it, it, it's what's left and it provides the origin of imaging um, measurements. So the cartoon at the, uh, uh, on the right here, the middle cartoon um, is, is, is one of the early imaging experiments. Um, it illustrates the fact that the scattering uh, processes are much stronger for heavier elements compared to light elements, uh, and there you see the contrast between you know, the, the the heavy elements in in the in the gold in the ring compared to the average uh, atomic number of the elements in in the in the bones and in the soft tissue in the hand. So these these absorption measurement the, the absorption processes and the scattering process have attenuated the beam as they pass through, um, and they give rise to an X-ray absorption image. And we'll look at that in a great bit more detail later on. And then thirdly, and I didn't touch on this um, at the time, but of course the, the bottom right cartoon is an illustration um, of a scattering process. Actually, it's one of the most famous photographs in, in science. It's the famous uh, photograph 51 taken by Rosalind Franklin of beta DNA. And it provided a key piece of evidence from which Crick and Watson um, uh, derived the or, or, or demonstrated the validity of the double helix structure of, of, of DNA. And we'll come back to crystallography and crystallographic methods later on. So most of this course for synchrotrons is going to be about um, scattering and diffraction, looking at structure, uh, and spectroscopy, looking at um, chemical composition and changing chemical character. Um, but I do want, to, before I move on to that, I just want to touch expand a little bit on, on the theme of imaging because X-ray imaging is probably the form of application of X-rays uh, that the majority of people are most familiar with. Um, it's, it was the first application of X-rays. So here on the left is Röntgen, excuse my uh, German pronunciation, um, the first recipient of a Nobel Prize in physics for, um, for the first observation of X-rays and the first demonstration of um, the unusual characteristic of x-rays was actually from well actually the very first one was through the fact that it <clears throat> stimulated fluorescence in a in a in, a, in an x-ray fluorescent material but very early on Röntgen um, discovered the 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 properties of x-rays to image um, according to differential uh, absorption and scattering uh, uh, for heavy elements compared to light elements uh, and he used to travel for the first uh, uh, in, in the years after this discovery, 
travel the, the, the lecture theatres and salons of Europe with his wife, Anna, in tow as the assistant and demonstrate. Um, this must be really creepy at the time. The first time anyone had seen inside people, seen the bones of people. It certainly freaked Anna Roncher now to, who exclaimed, I've seen my death. But this sort of it was a, you know, clearly a very graphic illustration of the power of x-rays. Uh, and it's, it, it's the one that's, of course, primarily used today in hospitals, body scanners, um, in um, sorry, in X-ray radiography, in, 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 in security scanners and airports and so forth. But with synchrotron X-rays, you can, you can perform that kind of measurement, but you can perform it far more powerfully. When you have a beam that is literally billions of times brighter than the source that you have in a hospital scanner or an airport scanner, that means you can, you can focus the beam down to much um, smaller spot sizes, you can make measurements far more quickly. And here's just by way of illustration, um, if the animation works, this is a three-dimensional modern radiogram of, um, actually it's a, it's, a, it's a fossilized shell. It's only a few millimeters long, but through a technique called tomography, which I'll illustrate in a moment, you can see exquisite details down to just a few microns across because you can now focus these beams down to microns you can look deep inside materials and you can make 3D images from adding together multiple slices of, of the image, each taken rap rapidly. So this, this technique known as tomography, and it comes from the Greek word from tomos, which means a slice, involves um, taking an X-ray image of a sample, then rotating it slightly, taking another image and building up a 360 degree view of the material and then reconstructing the image from this the set of 360 degree slices so we can now perform uh, these highly um, spatially resolved you know just a few microns spatial resolution 3d um, images of, 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 of materials now if that's all there was to synchrotron x-rays um, you'd still be left with difficulties looking at details of uh, of biological tissue if we go back to Anna Ronjan's hand here, what we observe is, of course, the strong contrast between the, the very heavy metal in the, in the, the, the gold in the ring uh, and, and, and the bones in the hand. But there's, you can see almost nothing of the soft tissue between the bones here. So x-rays in, in the conventional form are really not um, uh, particularly powerful at picking out details of um, uh, in, in material which has a very similar average atomic number or, or X-ray absorption. And here synchrotrons have an additional advantage. They're not just very bright, which allows us to focus them down and take these rapid pictures, which allows us to, to, to perform tomographic reconstruction, but they also have, <clears throat> uh, they can produce with a degree of coherence. And that enables us to also perform very sensitive imaging using coherence techniques, and I don't propose to go into this in any detail, but just really to make you aware of it, um, taking advantage of small uh, changes in, in the, the phase of the electrons as they, sorry, the phase of the photons as they travel through materials. So in the, in the conventional X-ray radiography measurement, um, where the difference between one region and another is determined by the difference in absorption so here we have just in this cartoon on the top left, one part of the X-ray beam goes through a region that absorbs and it comes out with a lower amplitude. Um, the other goes through uh, a region where there's almost no, little or no absorption. Um, if if the, the, the degree of absorption in this region and that region is very, very similar, then you have almost no contrast between uh, the beam going through here and the beam going through here. So if you wanted to, image detail in the soft tissue of the hand, this would be an extremely insensitive technique. If, however, you add the, um, the quality of um, the, the phase of the photon for coherent beams now, you have an additional piece of information. Um, so here we have uh, the first beam going through um, the material, but not only does it uh, might it absorb the x-rays to a slightly different extent and you see a, a change in the amplitude um, but also the phase of the um, of the x-ray beam may change as it goes through this material and actually um, shift in phase is something that's much more sensitive than than than, than change in the um, 
change in the amplitude for uh, for samples which have similar absorbances. And now when you compare these two um, uh, beams with a detector that can discriminate uh, according to the coherence, um, what you start to see is a contrast between two regions that might have very, very simple, similar absorbances, but have um, very similar absorbances, but one region introduces a phase shift compared to the other. And depending on, um, on how far from the, 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 the absorbing material uh, you place the detector, you can then pick out that, uh, that phase shift and therefore pick out contrast between these two, these two regions very, very sensitively. So what we have here is just an illustration of X-rays passing through a, a couple of human hairs. So human hair has very little difference in absorption compared, uh, compared to air. So in terms of just X-ray absorption, and this is the, the measurement that you see on the left-hand side, there's almost no contrast between the hair and the background air scattering. But as you pick out, as you, as you, as you, as you um, uh, change the sensitivity of the detector more and more to the difference in the phase of the, um, the, the, the photons going through the hair compared to the, to the air, so you see um, the contrast in the hands. So these coherence techniques used in x-ray imaging which are now possible with synchrotrons because there's an element of coherence in the in the photon beam allow us to perform really sensitive tomographic measurements now of materials composed of very similar um of of, of, of whose whose average atomic number or average uh, weight of the element is very similar so by way of illustration top left is a tomographic reconstruction of measurements um, taken of the, of the eye of a bee. So you can imagine a scale here, um, left to right, that's, oh, I don't, know, don't know how big the eye of a bee is, but I imagine it's sort of a millimeter or so across. Um, and we can now pick out the contrast in the soft tissue in that even though the absorption across the, um, uh, the sample is, 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 is very, very similar. Um, oh, sorry, let's stop that one. Don't worry. We'll come back to that one in a moment. Um, so here's here's just a, uh, an excursion, and of course an awful lot of this is, is done through very clever software and so forth, um, but the point is it's made possible, this, this 3D uh, imaging and then of course reconstruction analysis, uh, as you wish in the computer, is made possible because of this added coherence brings out um, a, a contrast between different areas that otherwise would look very, very similar if it was just down to X-ray absorbance. And then on the bottom right, so this is this this sample is of the order of a millimeter or so. Um, here we now have an image um, of of an individual cell that has been infected with a parasite. So to begin with, what you'll see is just different images that are measured at different rotation angles in the X-ray beam, and we'll see. And then computer programs start to um, work on the, uh, the 3D reconstruction to pick out of these various grayscales um, objects that represent the, the different um, structures within the cell. So in this particular case, what this is, is, um, is, is, a, is, a, is a mammal cell which has been infected with a, uh, with a particular parasite a toxoplasma gondii parasite. And what this now enables us to do is to look at growing parasites within a single cell. It could be malaria, it could be all sorts of things. Um, but with X-ray diffraction, uh, sorry, with X-ray tomography um, imaging measurements, we can now look at structures uh, at cellular level and actually pick out individual elements in, in a cell um, and also, if we perform this as a function of time, we can look. We can look at the growth of, um, uh, of, in this case, parasites within a, within a, within a, within a cell, and by that means get insights into way in which uh, not only parasites grow, but in which their growth can be in, inhibited in the search for for therapies. And then finally, with imaging, of course, um, imaging can also be applied to inorganic materials. Uh, life is not purely biological. It's well, life is biological, but <laughs> the, the world around us um, uh, uh, also uh, contains engineering materials. Um, uh, you will all be familiar with with batteries that fail, uh, whether it's in laptops, whether it's in the Dreamliners that were grounded a few years ago because the lithium ion batteries in them um, uh, got too hot and ignited, or more recently, um, uh, a certain brand of Samsung telephone um, that again gave rise to 
catastrophic um, heating and failure. Um, question, of course, was why did this occur? And in lithium ion batteries, the lithium ions that uh, are involved in transporting charge from one electrode to the other um, get in the process of that, that transport, get reduced to lithium metal. And under certain circumstances, that lithium metal can form deposits that stretch from one electrode to the other. And when that occurs, you get a short circuit and you get catastrophic heating. And one of the things that's been done with X-rays, uh, synchrotron X-rays at Diamond and at facilities elsewhere is to look at the growth of these lithium metal structures within batteries as the batteries are charged and discharged. So at the bottom here, there's a, there's a cartoon that illustrates measurements that are made um, of, and the, the I'm afraid I'm colorblind, but this colored object, it looks pinky red to me, um, is a measurement that was performed that revealed um, the growth of lithium metal structures, these dendritic or fern-like structures within a cell as it was charged and discharged, gives us direct proof of, of, the, of the catastrophic growth process. And that in turn tells material scientists and engineers what they need to put in place in, in their batteries to inhibit this growth and, this, and, and ultimately um, this failure. So what I hope I've illustrated there is, um, first of all, the three types of um, uh, interactions that X-rays have with the materials in just in very general terms, um, exciting electrons in spectroscopic measurements, um, scattering measurements, which can be used as the basis of diffraction, and then the X-rays that are left um, give rise to an image, uh, an absorption image, if you like, and that in turn can be used now as synchrotrons with these very powerful, high-resolution 3D images that with coherence can also involve um, uh, picking out details in soft and biological um, uh, materials. So a far cry from, from the X-rays that you're perhaps familiar with in, in medical scanners and in um, uh, uh, medical scanners and in airport security scanners. Oh, and finally, sorry, didn't quite come to the end. Um, <clears throat> the other big application of synchrotron X-rays in imaging is in non-destructive testing. So if you want to develop, and here's a, here's a good example, um, a high performance engineering material that has to with, undergo incredible stresses and strains. The traditional way of studying how resistant an engineering material component was would be to take that component. And here is, here's an example. This is in the bottom left. Um, it's a fan blade from a modern jet engine. Um, whilst the jet engine is running, it's subject to uh, very high temperatures, very high mechanical stress and strain. And of course, in the event of something like a bird strike, you also get that sort of um, impact and the effect of the impact on this, 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 this high performance uh, material. Um, and one of the things that is absolutely critical to engineers is that they understand um, what the failure mechanisms are so they can develop better materials or they can uh, manufacture them in different forms um, so they're much more resistant to wear and tear, but also the sort of catastrophic failure that you might get in the event of a, well, in the event of an event like a bird strike. Um, and the traditional way of studying these things, as I've said, would be to have taken this engineering component to subject it to these extreme conditions, mechanical, and then cut it open and analyze it. Now, the process of cutting open the material, <coughs> excuse me, actually disturbs the very thing that you're trying to measure. You know, if you're sawing open uh, part of a turbine, blade, how do you know that the action of cutting it apart doesn't disturb the very thing that you're trying to measure? And the beauty of synchrotron measurements is that they allow you to look at the structure in tremendous detail, uh, uh, look at small um, distortions uh, in the material, non-destructively. So we're using X-rays, you can look deep inside material at the atomic structure and uh, uh, higher length scale images up to millimeters and perhaps even centimeters um, without having to cut it open. Um, so one of the key things that's done at synchrotrons now is to try to solve engineering problems non-destructively, particularly in the case of materials that are subject uh, to these extreme conditions where failure is absolutely critical. So uh, aircraft companies, uh, companies making high performance vehicles, 
um, uh, components, for example, that um, are used in, 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 in the space industry. These are all things which absolutely should not fail. And therefore, understanding even the improbable failure mechanisms is, is absolutely cr critical. OK, so that was an overview of sorts of applications of synchrotron X-rays. And now what I want to do um, is look or, or present in slightly more detail the way in which X-rays uh, interact with atoms at uh, at an atomic scale and from that build up to uh, then an understanding about what that tells us about structure of materials at an atomic level and also the, the, the chemical composition of materials. And the fundamental interaction here um, uh, is the so-called Thomson effect. So the, the principal interaction between X-rays and materials at an atomic level that we'll be concerned with is due to what's called the Thomson effect. Uh, and I've, I've tried to illustrate that schematically in this cartoon. So we represent the, uh, the incoming photons, uh, the incoming uh, X-ray beam um, in terms of the, the electric component, the electromagnetic radiation, because the principal interaction is between the electric component of the EM radiation and the electrons in the material, or rather more specifically, the electrons in the atoms in the material. And I've just focused to begin with on, on an electron on an atom in a material, just to sort of imagine what the basic interaction is here. And that electric field, that oscillating electron field in the photon wave will drive um, the motion uh, of the electrons on the atoms in the same direction. Now, just as we saw that um, when an electron changes its trajectory, when it, or rather changes its direction when it moves in a circular arc, it gives out radiation. So the electron in the atom, when it's driven into oscillation by the electromagnetic radiation, will always also give out radiation. And that's the Thomson effect. Um, and there is a, a, an angular distribution of the, the, the radiation it's given off. So you, you're putting light you're putting photons in and to a first approximation what you get out is is a, is is photons of the same energy so that that electron is driven and it re-emits light at the same energy or the same wavelength if you prefer as the incoming radiation and the cartoon also illustrates the the angular distribution of the intensity of that radiation so in this direction at 90 degrees to the incoming photon beam um, sorry, this part of the cartoon here illustrates the relative intensity of the photons given off. So in this direction, 90 degrees to the instant direction, the, the intensity is zero and it reaches a maximum in the forward and the reverse direction. Uh, so no energy perpendicular to it. Now, you might expect that the greater the number of um, electrons on the atom, the greater the number of uh, electrons that can be driven and therefore give out light. And what we find is the intensity of this scattering, the intensity of the re-emission of the light goes with the number of electrons around the atom. Um, and that's that, that that's the same as the atomic number of the atom, goes with Z as Z squared. So the heavier the element, um, the, the brighter, um, <clears throat> the stronger the scattering, and the brighter um, the light that's that's that, that that's produced, and you can already see that that's sort of if you like um, uh, a principal reason why a heavy element absorbs um, uh, X rays much more strongly than um, uh, than than a lighter element. Now, that's the ideal picture. Uh, photon comes in, the electron component of the EM wave drives the movement of the electrons, it re-emits. Um, however, of course, those electrons are not perfectly free to move. Uh, they don't move perfectly freely under the influence of this driving um, electromagnetic radiation. They're acted upon by um, by the nucleus, which and the attraction to the nucleus acts as a, a damping effect. Uh, and we'll look at this in a little bit more detail when we talk about some of the details of X-ray diffraction. And this this has tremendous benefits in in trying to help us resolve complicated crystal structures. But for this. At this point, the key um, consequence of this is that the damping of the motion of the electron by the nucleus um, causes, uh, it slows down the motion of the electron and it causes some absorption. Excuse me, I'm going to cough. 
absorption of the x-rays so um as the uh, as um, and that absorption of the x-rays means that there is a differential absorption of the light as it travels through the material which corresponds to well those of you who are familiar in chemical spectroscopy with the Beer-Lambert law it obeys precisely the Beer-Lambert law so the 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 intensity that you get out divided by the incident intensity drops exponentially with the thickness of the material uh, and also the 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 the, the constant here in the the Beer-Lambert law is a is a measure of the absorb um, a, a, a absorptivity of the material. It's called the absorption coefficient. And the strength of that absorption goes very strongly with the, the atomic number Z. It goes as the power, with Z as, a power, uh, as, as the fourth power. And we also find that the higher the energy of the X-ray photons, the lower the absorption. So for example, and this has a practical effect, um, uh, the higher the energy of X-rays that are used in hospital x-ray the lower the absorption actually the less damaging per unit dose the x-rays are it sounds a little bit counterintuitive but if you use higher energy x-rays uh, in a in, in a hospital x-ray actually it's less damaging to people than lower energy x-rays um, and these two graphs illustrate those two effects and these these are something that's going to pervade um, our appreciation of the use of x-rays in a variety of techniques so it's worthwhile sort of and we'll 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 pause uh, shortly after this, we're coming to the end of the first lecture. Um, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, we we illustrate um, the change in the absorption of um, uh, of of materials as a function of the atomic number of the material. So, going to heavier elements, uh, very light elements such as lithium, all the way down through to lead and gold. And what you see is that the um, the absorption cross-section um, does rise strongly with Z. And actually the gradient here, you note, um, is, is approximately, this is a log-log scale and the gradient is four. So that represents that Z to the fourth dependency. Um, and as you go to, so this is the absorption of X-rays of 20 kilovolt energy as a function of Z, lower energy X-rays, single kilovolts, and then 50 electron volt energies. Uh, so there's a factor of 400 in energy and what we see is that as we go to high energy x-rays so the um the strength of the absorption per amount of material drops as we go to high energy um as we go to heavier elements so we find the absorption um, increases okay so general rule of thumb is heavier elements much stronger absorption um and uh, lower energy x-rays much stronger absorption it's interesting also looking what happens when you put different elements uh, 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 in the x-ray beam uh, and you look at their um, absorption cross-section as a function of energy. Um, so we, we've already seen that the absorption cross-section increases as you go to heavier elements. So you go from a, a first row element like beryllium through to a second row element in the periodic table like silicon to a much heavier element like lead. And the absorption coefficient, as you might expect, as we saw from, uh, well, actually we saw gold in the case of radi the radiogram with Röntgen's wife's hand, um, the absorption cross-section goes up strongly. But you also start to see, you see, well, you don't start to see, you also see that as you scan the energy from low to high values, you see a series of discontinuities, what we call absorption edges. So the case of silicon, for example, um, on the scale, we see about 100 electron volts. We see a, a, a very strong rise in absorption um, as, as we go through this absorption edge and then it drops. And then when we get to a little bit more than 1,000, it's, it's close to 2,000 electron volts, we see a, a second absorption edge. And this effect um, was observed again about 100 years ago. And uh, we, we now uh, understand it extremely well in terms of the known uh, electronic structure of the atom, but it was one of the pieces of evidence that was used to unravel um, uh, the, the structure, uh, the, the, the electronic structure of the elements. Mm. And actually the, the person who first saw an absorption edge, uh, you know, you see a spectroscopic transition, you want to give it a name or a label, um, and he had no idea what was going on. Um, <clears throat> he didn't know if there were transitions above or below it in energy. So he picked a letter in the middle of the 
uh, of the alphabet, he picked the letter K and he said, right, I've, I've seen this, this spectroscopic uh, discontinuity, this edge in the absorption spectrum. Um, there may be transitions above it or below it. So let's keep our options open, give it a letter in the middle of the alphabet, call it K. Now, as it turns out, and we'll look at this uh, in a moment in a bit more detail, um, he, he was the first person to observe the highest energy possible, the highest energy transition possible in the element in, in, in the elements. There were no higher energy transitions. He could have started at A and worked his way up, um, but he didn't know. And for that historic reason, we, we, we start the labeling of absorption edges um, in elements with the letter K. Um, and the letter K corresponds to absorption transitions from the, the most um, deeply seated, the lowest energy electrons. And again, <clears throat> those of you uh, who can remember, who, who are familiar with your, uh, your atomic spectroscopy, um, will know that schematically uh, the, the electronic structure of, um, uh, of an atom looks a little bit like this. So, um, so that the most deep seated uh, core electronic um, uh, uh, energy levels have a principal quantum number uh, n equals one. Um, uh, <clears throat> they can only have uh, electrons with one type of orbital angular momentum, uh, zero, which is labeled s. Um, so there is one state, um, one electronic state, which we populated by up or down spin electrons uh, closest to the to the core. Um, then as you go to heavier elements, um, the next level up has principal quantum number. And excuse me, this is really elementary revision for some of you, but I just want to be sure we're all on the, on the same page. Uh, the next level up is the so-called N equals uh, two level, uh, principal quantum number two. Uh, electrons in this level can have total angular momentum uh, zero or one. These are the so-called S or P states. Um, and if you have an uh, orbital angular momentum one, that can couple both with or against the electron uh, um, spin of a half. So you get total momentum states, J of three halves or one half and so on. So what one sees is a, a succession of energy levels, principal quantum number one, two, three, depending on how heavy the element is. Um, and then as you go up this ladder, you, you then have an increasing number of allowed orbital angular momentum states so n equals one has none, uh, or rather it only has the, the, S equal, the, the, the L equals zero state S. Um, uh, the next shell up, which is labeled L, can have S and P electrons, and has a total of three different types of energy levels. The next shell up uh, is the M um, shell, and it can have S, P, and now orbital angular momentum equals two, D um, uh, subshells, and so on. So one sees, depending on the, um, the, the, the position of the element in the periodic table, a ladder of states based around the principal quantum numbers, one, two, and so forth, um, with shells, K equals K, L, and M. And these correspond to successive um, uh, absorption edges. So in the case of, of, um, uh, of, of uh, silicon, for example, as we scan up in energy, um, what we see is, is a succession of absorption edges um, corresponding to um, uh, the M and then the uh, L and then the K subshell, the K subshell being the highest in energy and the most deep seated. Now, um, so, so those electrons are successively ionized as one uh, exposes to the atom to photons of increasing energy. Um, uh, those of you, again, who are familiar with um, principal spe spectroscopy will know that spectroscopic transitions are subject to so-called selection rules, which means there are um, restrictions to the way in which the quantum number can change in, uh, in an electronic transition. If they go from one electronic energy state to another electronic energy state. Now, in this case, these electrons all end up ejected from the atom, they end up as free electrons. They have no, um, uh, they no longer have a, a quantum number associated with uh, um, the shells K, L, and M. They don't have a, an angular momentum uh, 
the Norval's angular momentum quantum number. So there is no constraint. There is no quantum mechanical constraint on the transitions that you can see. All of these transitions are allowed. So as you increase the energy of the incident X-rays, um, all transitions in principle can be seen provided that your X-ray energy is, is high enough. Okay, last slide and then I'll break for today. Um, what happens next? So if you've subjected an element to photons of sufficient energy to uh, ionize to take off the electrons, you will leave behind a hole in the electronic um, uh, uh, structure. So you start off with uh, an atom at rest, your photons come in, you photoionize it and you leave behind a hole. And there are two things that can happen next and we'll, we'll end here. Um, the most common thing is that an electron can drop from an excited state down into this lower energy state and the energy that is released is released as as light and this is a x-ray X -ray fluorescence process so this photoionization event can be followed by fluorescence or generation of x-rays um, with an energy corresponding to the difference in energy between these two electronic states and that uh, is unique to a particular element. So X-ray fluorescence, as we'll see next week, um, or see in the next lecture rather, gives you a unique fingerprint as to what element uh, has been placed in the X-ray beam. And, 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 and we'll see historically why this was very significant. Alternatively, the atom can relax electronically uh, once you've created this hole um, with a combination of an electron dropping down to occupy this hole and then the excess energy not being given out as light as it does uh, it is this the case with x-ray fluorescence um, but that energy can then be given to another electron in the um, in the atom and it's then ejected as what's called an Auger electron so these two techniques are what are called spectroscopic techniques they give rise to either fluorescence light light in the form of fluorescence or secondary photoionized electrons each of which are absolutely characteristic give a fingerprint for the particular element and you can perhaps start to see that this is a powerful technique for analyzing exactly what elements you have um, in a sample and i'm going to finish at that point a because uh we've gone beyond an hour um uh christine hasn't interrupted me yet with questions shall i stop sharing um christine uh is that because th there were no questions no, <laughs> i presume very clear so that's why it was crystal clear if we can say crystallographically speaking. <laughs> oh, <dear>. so um <laughs> i i don't know how you want to play this at this point I'm, I'm i'm certainly open for questions either on the chat line or if people can speak directly um indeed so do we have any questions from the audience so no. I think the, the, the presentation I think was very clear and really interesting I see to also to see all the different evolutions so to link uh, historically as well the different evolution why all those different levels looking at uh, the equipment as well which at that time I guess uh, would give only those uh, level of energy um, so do we Try to think uh, maybe in terms of uh, the... Ah, we have a question. Samela is coming through. Um, you see a question. We should... so good. Yeah, yeah. So in the chat line, Samela, thank you. Um, yeah. I, 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 so I'm actually going to touch on this. Uh, in, in, in a nutshell, it is X-ray fluorescence. Um, and that will give you precisely that, a fingerprint as to whether you've got manganese or sulfur in a cell. Um, and nowadays you can, so if you want, you can simply put a batch of cells in your, um, uh, in your beam and say that within your batch of cells, you have the, there's a certain level of manganese or sulfur or almost any element you choose, as long as your X-ray beam is of the right energy. And because we have a synchrotron, we can tune the energy to pick out the element. Um, and you can look down to less, th well, typically parts per billion so this is an extremely sensitive technique and i'll actually touch on how you do this in a, in a, in about two lectures time and actually you can do not only that what's really neat you might want to know 
whether your manganese was in the form of, I don't know, manganese two plus, manganese four, manganese seven. Um, and the, the fact that you can look at very small changes in synchrotron photon energy means you can look at really subtle differences in the oxidation state of, um, of the element. So you, you, you can tell not only that you've got manganese there, but you can actually tell what the oxidation state of the manganese is. Um, only with X-ray fluorescence, you can do it to some extent with OJ spectroscopy. It's a, people rarely do that. Um, I, just let's say it's not a very common technique. The great thing about fluorescence um, is it's extremely sensitive. You're looking at light emitted against a dark background, whereas in absorption, you're looking at the difference between a bright light and a less bright light. So fluorescence is easily the mo mo most sensitive and common technique. But we'll do that in a, in a future lecture in more, in more detail. So Samela, do you use any kind of equivalent technique? Or I don't know You're if welcome. you want to maybe share your experience. Huh? Might be interesting if you want to. Sure. And I think if, if Christine, you said that it's okay if people want to contact me by email and ask further mm -hmm. questions, which is absolutely fine. Yeah. That, that would be yeah. as well very good. And as maybe you mentioned, so that would be the topic as well of next lecture. So it would be good after that lecture to look yeah. at the I'll touch very briefly on fluorescence in the next, start next lecture, but we'll do it in much more detail in about, I think, in lecture four. In lecture four. Um, yeah. And I think in any case, my slides, I'll try and make all my slides online. I think the first two lectures are the ones that are currently online. And I'll get three, four, five, and six available very soon. So you, you, you can look ahead if you want. Yeah, very good. So do we have more questions? Oh, I see that uh, that Anna logged in as well. So so then if you would compare, for instance, with uh, the, we're mentioning indeed for the third generation, so with those, uh, I mean, 14 order of magnitude more. So now with the upgrade of diamond, so what much more do you expect? It's a good question. So um, synchrotron technology, as we understand it, has almost reached its ultimate limit. Um, and so, th so to answer the question directly, um, if you upgrade a third generation synchrotron uh, like diamond, you can probably get a hundred to a thousand times more brightness out of it. Um, so there is a new, better technology, um, primarily because we have better magnets nowadays. Mm -hmm. you, can, you, can, you can create a synchrotron ring with more compact, smaller magnets, um, and that enables you to squeeze um, even more brightness and coherence out of out of the vote, but there's a physical limit called the diffraction limit mm -hmm. beyond which you can't go uh, with a with a storage ring, and beyond that, there's a completely different technology that I haven't actually touched on, and I hadn't planned to, but of course, it, um, I, I I could think about it. But so-called free electron lasers mm -hmm. offer uh, many more out orders of magnitude brighter photons still but in a form that is currently much less stable. So, so there are further generation X-ray free electron lasers um, that generate yet, yet brighter photons, but we, we have not yet developed into a state where they're as reliable and as reproducible. So, um, so there's a, they're, they're wonderful, but they tend to be for much more specialized niche experiments. Um, I compare them like, you know, it's like we, you know, a Saturn V rocket goes a lot further and faster than a 747. Uh, but for the majority of, you know, the majority of the time when people go through the air, they, they take a plane rather than a, than a, than, than, um, uh, than, than a dop space flight. So, um, so these are machines that can do yet more wonderful things, but they're still quite niche. Um, and uh, and I, I think that's a subject for a future and developing course because we're still finding our way with fells. It would be interesting indeed because with uh, the Max 4 as well, there was the space uh, available there is. for that. For the yeah. Yeah, but then absolutely. so far, so that could be with the multiband achromat as well. Or you are really focusing on, of course, using the different type of uh, magnet technology to permit uh, this. Uh, yes, but it's all multiband achromat technology. Yeah. Even third generation sources now 
multi-band acromats. Um, it's just that they become more sophisticated multi-band acromats to use a, uh, when, when you go to this, this, this fourth generation source, yeah. Uh, in a sense, it's not a huge difference. The, the big difference was first to second and second to third. And second to third, when you introduce the insertion devices, third to fourth is, is it a fourth or is it just a enhanced third? It's, it's, I, um, it's, it's, you know, people argue about it. It is brighter, but actually the principles are quite similar. Mm -hmm. yeah, similar principle, but maybe so still, uh, so with the, the technology, the resolution so would be also much better or, or it's kind of, uh, depending on the brightness. So as you go brighter, you can you can focus the spot size down. Um, so so consequences of increased brightness, there are several of them. One of them is you get smaller spots. So you can you can do these imaging measurements with much higher spatial resolution. Um, also if the x-rays are much brighter you can perform a diffraction or a spectroscopy experiment much faster you know if you've got if basically if you have a beam that's 100 times brighter you can make a measurement 100 times faster and as we'll see in later lectures you know in normal crystallography people would measure the structure of a of a they just measure the structure of a crystal it's a static measurement you know you 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 learn what the structure of dna is at the other end for example um these sources are now getting so bright that you can start to look at the way in which a crystal structure changes during a transformation. Um, and uh, we, we're, we're starting to be able to make diffraction measurements, not in minutes, but in very small fractions of a second. So it opens up the ability to look at processes rather than static structures. And for example, if you want to look at a manufacturing process in industry, you know, traditionally, you might take minutes or hours to make a measurement, which is way beyond the time over which something changes in the manufacturing process. If you want to look at something in milli or microseconds, you can start to do that um, with modern with modern synchrotrons. So, you know, over the course that I've used synchrotrons, where uh, as a grad student, I would take, yeah, I mean, you know, you measure a sample an hour, you now are measuring samples in less than, sometimes less than a second. Um, and actually the thing that takes the time is not the measurement now, it's actually just putting a new sample in the beam. Um, and that's where all the robotics and the automation come, come in. And that would be interesting to put this word as well of uh, how the robotic is now permitting as well as you were mentioning, I think last week, yeah. all those uh, remote uh, possibility as well to make the measurement. That's right. As well, so with the fact that this is much faster, so you can better understand the phenomenology of some of the, the evolution of uh, and for instance, cells level, but as well to be less destructive as well in some of those. So seeing in vivo more or less, or closer to in vivo um, potentiality. Indeed, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I've just seen there's another question from Samela. Um, okay. Samela, I'm I'm going to have to. I'm a really sorry. I I have a um, I have to be somewhere else in one minute, um, uh, and that's a really interesting question. Actually, probably this is something we can do in a follow up lecture or or or, or offline. Um, but actually, synchrotron X-ray fluorescence measurements um, could be a very, I mean, synchrotrons, we're one of them, are looking at the correlation between the accumulation of certain elements and certain types of disease, particularly in neurodegeneration. So if you want to look at the origins of Alzheimer's disease, for example, there's an awful lot of work now that's going into what is the correlation between damaged tissue and the elemental composition of the tissue. And when it comes back to cancer, um, the 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 other thing you might want to look at is there's some really interesting work on cancer that also involves infrared measurements at synchrotrons because the infrared tells you not just about the element but it tells you about the molecule that might be implicated uh, in the cancer. Um, so, but I, I would say for correlating element maps with uh, cancerous tissue probably synchrotron x-ray fluorescence measurements are the most powerful um but but we will and, and actually christine what's quite interesting is when you see the questions coming through uh it makes me wonder about just changing some of the material later on and this is i think a very good uh, idea so because it would be good to be useful directly to yeah uh, yeah so we're, i think we're, <laughs> we're learning here aren't we yes, <laughs> this, that's how this, it I, 
Yeah. Adaptation is also so really important. So, yeah. so indeed, so it will be very good. And I hope that Samela will be available as well for following the, the coming lectures, because maybe some of the answer will be there and then you will have more time yeah. as well. And we can maybe distribute it a bit differently to have more time for the question. You will. Okay, cool. Right. Look, I'm, I'm, so thank you Christine, everybody, I'm really sorry. I have to go now, but I look forward to the next session. And, and again, comments on sort of level of, because yeah, I'm aware that you probably got all sorts of different backgrounds and and you know i'm trying to guess at what level to pitch it so it's useful to get a rough idea and i'm it may be the answer is some of it's too high and some of it's too low but it's useful to know that kind of thing as well i think um, it's pretty good as well you progress in a, in a very um slow way which is good as well to be able to grab uh, everything yeah so pick up like later on yeah okay, okay cool thank you very much uh, thank you very much Andrew. see you on thursday thank see you christine you. see everyone on thursday yeah. bye, bye for now Take care. Bye. Have fun. Right. Bye.